Right guys, Habakkuk. Habakkuk chapter 1, 12 to 17. Habakkuk is struggling then with this perennial problem for people of faith. You've got our faith. We're prepared to be faithful people. We're prepared to say, yeah, I believe, I believe. But then the rubber hits the road. And you've got an appearance in a fallen world of the situation being like this. But then we're told by our God that actually in heaven and eternity and so on, it's like this. And you've got to hold the two together. And that's what faith is. It's holding together the appearance of the world in which we live and the eternal realities of things that are actually true and trusting God with that. Trusting God with that difference. So frequently, we've said this a number of times before, Christian character, the character of the person of faith, is formed between the hammer and the anvil. And so often it's the hammer of our current experience in a fallen world, but the anvil of God's truth in his word and what is actually true in eternity. And that's where it happens. Now Habakkuk is faced with that conflict at this point in time. He's being hammered on the anvil. And he's actually got to the point of actually challenging God. And that's where he starts in this book, in chapter 1. He's challenged God because it seemed that God was doing nothing about the godlessness of the people of Habakkuk's place and time. And Habakkuk said to God, why are you doing nothing about these people? And God said, you think I'm doing nothing? Behind the scenes where you don't see, I'm doing a lot. God has responded to Habakkuk's two questions, his twin questions, why and how long, with a very clear indication that God has not been inactive, that he's got it all in hand, and more than Habakkuk wants to see happen, is about to happen, is very close to happening, because God has known far above and beyond all that Habakkuk has ever known, all along. The monarchy, the Jewish monarchy will go, and the nation state will go. And in the outworking of the great plan and purpose of God, that terrible seeming thing is going to prepare the way, the way of the Messiah and the kingdom, no longer of kings, men kings, but the kingdom of God. So the unified monarchy, which they all looked to and thought, oh, marvellous, the days of David, looking backwards, hasn't worked. It hasn't worked. God said at the beginning of setting apart human kings for Israel, that isn't going to work. But they're insistent, and they wanted it. And they, he said, God, I'm going to give it to you, and this is what's going to happen. And it has just happened. And it's against that just happening that Habakkuk is crying out. And God is now saying, okay, we're going to go back to plan A, which was my plan all along, which was going to happen all along, because it was going to have to. I'm going to wipe out these kingdoms of men, all these daft things you thought you wanted, and I'm going to bring the Messiah, the King, and the Kingdom of God. Mercy for sin, pardon for sin, and a peace that endures. Habakkuk didn't know all that yet. So in the mix of all of that, Habakkuk has just heard what's going to happen, and he's going, ah, ah, no! It's a huge bombshell. And that's why he's complaining here in these verses in uh, chapter 1, uh, 12 to 17. Huge bombshell. Not least because of the suddenness and thoroughness of it all, which is a bit ironic given Habakkuk's first complaint. He was, he was saying, why have you done something? God said, I'm doing this. And he whoa, that's too much. And God said, you know, he's saying to God, how long? God said, now. And that's too much for Habakkuk as well. But, but Habakkuk mixes all that up because he, he can't bear to think of the wickedness and of the idolatry of the people who are going to be God's instruments in all this. God is choosing to use people that Habakkuk would not have had used. And we've got to be prepared for that with our God as well. Because he's a little bit more radical than the rest of us. So where does this then, where, where are we in the structure of Habakkuk's prophecy? Chapter 1, 1 4, Habakkuk makes his complaint about how bad things are in the state. And God has responded instead of doing this. And now Habakkuk's complaining about the response. Doesn't like the response that God's given him. And then God will go on and respond to that. And then you see a transformed Habakkuk in chapter 3. So, 
Habakkuk, as we begin this passage, he's been complaining bitterly that God wasn't doing anything about the spiritual state of the land. He's now way on the opposite extreme. Stunned by what God is on the very verge of doing, rattled by the people who will be doing this, and Habakkuk is feeling like he's been clobbered. Habakkuk is reeling. Habakkuk is utterly confused. As his expectations of God, previously scandalised, frustrated by these expectations not being met through God's apparent inactivity. God wasn't inactive, but he seemed to be. He's once again got his expectations of God shattered by the extent, by the nature, by the intensiveness of what God's going to do. So here's the question, what do you do then? When the foundations are rattled and you are shaken. When you're utterly rattled by what God has done or is doing. What are you going to do? You're going to trust Him? Or you're not? Because that's the, that's the dividing line. That's where faith happens or doesn't happen. The faith of it. And God has dismayed or shaken or, or surprised having so much. Having a... He just resorts to going back to what God is like. There are sometimes in life, there are occasions, there are situations, there are circumstances. You do not understand what is going on. You just do not get it. You do not know. Your human brain cannot comprehend what on earth is going on here. Where'd you go? Having a teacher that straight away he goes back to the character of God. But what do we know about it? We don't understand this. We don't get this. This is a what situation. And what do you do with it? You go back to the character of God. What's he like? What do I know about it? That's what we do. Faith resorts to the character of God. There's tons I don't understand. There's tons I don't like. But what's he like? Now the natural challenge posed to faith by the apparent triumph of the forces of Godness, as it has an effect on you, it has an effect on the faithful. But it has the effect of suggesting that God is no longer at his post. Let's put it like that. God, where are you in it? What, what, where, where are you? Habakkuk's first reminder to himself of the character of God, verse 12a, is this. God is not there. Here's what it says. Lord, are you not from everlasting? My God, my Holy One, you will never die. So in two dimensions. In time past... You're everlasting. You're way back, in, eternal in the, in the past. But, but Lord, you, you're never going to die. You're eternal to the future as well. So he's standing at this point looking back and looking forwards. God is not dead. And this is a real important thing to get hold of. Given the way God does not usually take us into his counsel as if he needs us, needs us to give him our advice, you know? He doesn't usually do that. The cause for the trust of his people when we don't know what's going on it's easy sometimes to think he's given up on the job. Isn't it? Do you remember Elijah and the prophets of Baal? Now they were dead gods. And Elijah's standing on the mountain with you know, the altars up there and whatever, the, the offerings ready on the altar. And uh, the prophets of Baal are there all day, cutting themselves and slashing themselves the way they did in their religion and jumping around and trying to get fire to come from heaven and set fire to the, to the, to the, to the wood around the altar. And Elijah stands there and he talks to them and he says, Shout louder, perhaps he's deaf, you know, perhaps he's on a journey, perhaps he's, you know, where is your God? He's not, he's not listening. Perhaps, shout louder, he's got a bit, you know, hard of hearing in his old age. Like, he must have been a really interesting preacher to listen to, you know, because he, he really went for it, you know? And then, of course, he says, Lord God of heaven, just let, let people know, let them see that today that there is a God in Israel, and that I'm your prophet. And fire comes from heaven and sets fire. Now, it looked as if Elijah did not have a leg upon which to stand. One man alone on a mountain top, and he just drenched the altar and the kindling with water. Buckets and buckets of water. And God steps in. Habakkuk has to go back to this, that, that God hasn't given up on the job. He's not asleep, he's not on holiday, he's not dead. But in his distress at the impact of the things that have been told him in, in the immediately preceding verses, given what he sees, it's no wonder, isn't it, that Habakkuk's thoughts are running on while he's not dead. And he's saying, no, you're not dead. You haven't been, you've always been there, and you're not going to be, you will never die. And these Babylonians are coming, and they're going to overrun the nation, and they're bound to give some verbal abuse to the abilities, to the existence 
of Israel's God. You say, you're not, you're not there. Come on, not there. Do you remember the 60s? Do you remember the death of God controversy? Do you remember all that stuff when theologians were coming out and saying, oh, God must be dead? Where were those guys? They are dead. But God is still alive and at work in his church as we can see and through the answered prayers we've been talking about this morning. Even that. There are always plenty around us, like Job's wife, who in this set of horrible experiences that can come upon you in this world would urge the afflicted man to curse God and die. But Habakkuk starts off his resort into the character of God for help, for comfort, for stability in his difficult experience by remembering that God is not dead. He is not dead, and there's more to it. He is not dead, he is the Lord. He is the Lord. Now, it, it's Yahweh, it's the divine name, it's the, the big name for God that's being used here. He's being referred to in his role as the rightful king. Now, you've got to get this idea, because this is important to it. He is the covenant king of Judah. He is the suzerain. Israel and Judah have had their little kings, Timnock kings. They're like client kings, they're like vassal kings. And, and in, in the pattern of thought, in, in this ancient Near Eastern idea about suzerain, you treat this and all the rest of it, God is the, the great king in the distant land, but he's got vassal kings in, in his country. Do you see the sort of idea? You, you're happy with that? No? He is the covenant, covenant suzerain, the great king, who has the right to rule because of the covenant. Now, to cut a long story short, the right to kingship in ancient Near Eastern political theory, why we do some interesting things here, it rested on the term cutting a covenant. And covenants were cut in stone, because that's what they had. You'd have a stele, or which is a sort of clearer rock, or you'd have tablets on a wall somewhere in a temple, or something of the sort. But you'd have this covenant that was cut. It was the terms of the relationship. A people, often a subject people, with a real choice in the matter, but a people agreed to accept the sovereignty of a particular potentate. And there were provisions, and they specified the nature of the relationship on both sides. And they agreed to, I don't know, pay taxes, and he agreed to, to rule them well and give them justice and courts and protection against their invaders. Yeah? Stuff like that. When you see a reference to the Lord in capitals, in our English translation of the Bible, you're seeing a reference to the covenant king, the great king, or the suzerain, over Israel's other rulers, and that God, that, that suzerain, faithfully keeps the covenant that he's cut with his people. Israel's kings, portrayed in the Old Testament as vassal kings then, of the great king Jehovah. And that great king, Jehovah, has appointed these incoming Babylonian hordes to execute his justice. You, Lord, you, suzerain, have appointed these to execute justice, <coughs> as spelled out in your covenant, in the provisions. The things that are happening here are all provided for in Deuteronomy. They're all provided for when Samuel gave Israel her first king. This is going to happen. If you behave like that, this is what's going to happen. Here it is happening. So it's Israel's rock, her protector, who had administered the blessings of the covenant, the provision and the protection, who now administers the punishment parts of the covenant as part, part of his overarching intention, which is to bless. To bless by bringing the kingdom of God, the Messiah King, to bring Jesus. So it's God's righteous rule as Judah's legitimate ruler that Habakkuk reminds himself of in these verses. You, covenant king, Yahweh, have appointed them to execute judgment. You, my rock, have ordained them to punish. God's righteous rule. God is proving faithful to the covenant as he executes its penalty clauses, if you wish. You know, there's uh, Ebal and Gerizim, when they're instituting the covenant with Moses, there are the blessings on Ebal and the curses on Gerizim, isn't it? Or is it the other way around? I always get it mixed up, right? <laughs> so there's, there's one or the other. There's a bunch of people, a bunch of Levites and people, a bunch of the people stand on one mountain and a bunch on the other. And one recites the blessings of the covenant and one recites the penalties. God is bringing faithfully the penalties on this day. 
at the end of the day, the biggest thing we know about God, incidentally, the biggest and most crucial fact the unbelieving world around us today has forgotten is that God is set apart from sinners. God is not like us. You can't remember God is He's other than we are. He's other. He's above us. He's the holy, and that means set apart, different from us, God. And here's what Habakkuk is saying, verse 13. Your eyes are too pure to look on evil. You cannot tolerate wrongdoing. Now it's difficult to conceive of somebody like that, isn't it? Who in his absolute righteousness and justice and set apart and differentness from us cannot bear to look at sin. <clears throat> the way things have worked out in the world and the things we see, they really challenge that. When, when go back to Adam and Eve and gardens and apples, you know, when Satan tempted Adam and Eve, he hit on a wheeze that resulted in great potential for ongoing rebellion against God. Because if he could tempt them to, to, to sin, he'd bring chaos into the cosmos. God was going to have to deal with sin, God was going to have to judge sin, and chaos would come into the world. And that has given human beings their biggest reason to rebel against God ever since. We don't like the way things are in the world, and we blame God for it, and that's not where it came from. One of the most common arguments I hear people use against God is the argument from the presence of evil, pain, and suffering in the world. How can there be a God of love when? You know something? So Satan approaches Eve in the Garden of Eden with the express objective of tempting the humans to sin, trying to persuade them they could know better than God, knowing full well that's going to give them the best argument across the ages for rejecting God. The holy God would, because of his holiness, have to act on what happened in judgment, and that judgment would be misconceived by hurting humanity as evidence that God wasn't holy. It is holiness that's doing it. Neat trick, huh? And all the while these things that make it feel otherwise are happening, says Habakkuk, I know your eyes are too pure to look on evil. I know that you cannot tolerate wrong. And however I understand what I'm seeing, I'm understanding it with my little pea brain and attributing wrong to you. No, 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 no. I know. You're too pure for that. It just contrasts my perception of the things that I see. Now this isn't the end of the matter, because this fact about God is to be held in tension with the things that we see around us, which seem to contradict it, but he's saying, you are holy, you are too pure to look on evil. You cannot tolerate wrong. And all the while, faith tells him one thing, the stuff we've just been looking at, Habakkuk is conscious and aware that his eyes are trying to tell him another. What he sees is trying to tell him the opposite. So here it comes. Faith resorts to the character of God and sight complains of the things that it sees. Now, that's not quite right because it's the sight of faith that complains to God of the things that it sees. Uh, let's get this nailed down to start with. It's okay to trust God and complain about something. It's okay. Not necessarily complain about things to me or Helena Caris or Tom or Andy Powell. But to complain of him. Or Caleb, by the book. No, so, so that's why you've got so many complaints in the Bible against God. For, for God's book, it's got an awful lot of complaints against him in it. We don't see that, do we? You go through the book of Psalms, a third of the Psalms at least, at least a third, are complaints. It's the worship book! A third of it is complaints! Because the way we perceive the world is uh, limited and uh, wrapped with pain. The pain of living in a fallen world and not understanding. And faith takes that to God. Faith does not allow that to drive a wedge between itself and God, but it takes it realistically and forthrightly to God. And having to do that. It's a natural question as you look out on a world that hurts. Verse 13b, why then do you tolerate the treacherous? I know you're like this, I trust you, I know that's right about you. But why do you tolerate that? Why do you tolerate the treacherous? Why are you silent while the wicked swallow up those more righteous than themselves? Why? Why is that? It's a 
natural question. It's not just a Christian question, it's a natural question. I hear atheists asking that question because it is in our nature, however much we have a surprising ability to suppress it, it's in our nature to recognize a God and to reach out to him for, for somebody to blame even when things don't suit our plans or our agenda. Where does an atheist believe in God? Well, he's got something to complain about. Against it. But do you notice what is surprisingly lacking in Habakkuk's complaint against God? Why then do you tolerate the treacherous? Why are you silent while the wicked swallow up those more righteous than themselves? What's missing? Habakkuk is charging the one worthy being in the universe, the only one there is, with wrongdoing. But Habakkuk is mentioning no consciousness of sin in himself. None. He has conveniently forgotten about his own sin, his own sinfulness, in finding someone else who can accuse of injustice. And that's humanity for you, isn't it? We feel better about our own rubbish when we can find somebody else to accuse of injustice or whatever it is. <coughs> I've had that experience just in the last, you know, very, very recently. Someone's chosen a path that's not according to God's word and, and Whilst that's honestly acknowledged, there are others at fault. And we're all like that, and we all do it. Habakkuk attributes guilt to the Babylonians, guilt to God of all people, but his current thing attributes none of the responsibility to the people of Judah, or to himself as their prophet, their watchman for God. Go watch that. An adequate sense of conviction of his own sin would have kept Habakkuk, or the people for whom he speaks, from attributing wrongdoing in this to God. And from piercing his own heart with all this grief. It's complaint against God that God is silent. God's just spoken! Is God ever silent? His complaint is that God is silent whilst the wicked go gobbling up those who are more righteous than themselves. Here is what gives rise to his fierce outrage and indignation. Verses 14 to 16. The sovereign God offers no protection. Verse 14. Now we can feel like that. We know it's not true because we see instances where his protection is pretty patent and obvious. right? But when you're in this bind, when you're thrashing around and you're hurting with it all, God, why aren't you looking after me? And he is. But it don't feel like it. Here's what gives rise to happy experience indignation. You have made people, verse 14, like the fish in the sea. Like the sea creatures that have no ruler. So... In the ancient Near Eastern political system, a ruler was there to lead out the armies, give protection to his subjects in the land. And life without active governance in that situation would be nasty, poor, brutish and short, to use Bob's description of life in a state of nature. Right? Kings were there to deal with all of this. So Habakkuk is actually accusing God, Israel's covenant king, with a serious dereliction of his duty. With abandoning his covenant faithfulness. Because you've made us like this fish, you've got no ruler. No ruler for what? No ruler to protect them. The Israelites are like fish. Landlocked Judea. The fish seem to be utterly unprotected. Mere quarry to be predated. And they aren't simply vulnerable, they are being predated upon. And this next bit in verse 15, it looks like a poetic flight of fancy, doesn't it? The wicked foe pulls all of them up with hooks. He catches them in his net. He gathers them up in his dragnet, strange expression. And so he rejoices and is glad. What's going on? Looks like a sort of poetic description of the fish and stuff. But actually, you know, the Babylonians did this. They did pull up the Israelites with hooks. That, that's a, a carved relief of, of, of from Babylonia, of the way that they led captives away into captivity. That is horrible stuff. 
gory kind of view, isn't it? But what they did with their captives was they put hooks through their bottom lip and tied it to a rope and led them off single the file to captivity. Horrendous people! Horrendous things happening. They invaded the land, they took captives, they pushed hooks through their bottom lip and they led them off single file to Babylon. It happened to the people of Judah and there's the archaeological evidence for it. Additionally, there are inscriptions about the net. The wicked foe pulls all of them up with hooks, he catches them in his net, his dragnet. There are inscriptions, and old Palmer Robertson refers to them in his commentary, to captives being taken to Babylonia, being netted and dragged along the ground by horses in the net to Babylon. Can you see where the complaint of Habakkuk is coming from? He's born right out of the suffering and humiliation of the people of God. What doesn't accompany this complaint is any sense for the moment of the unworthiness of the people which gives rise to all this. An unworthiness Habakkuk was in fact complaining about just a little bit earlier on, do you remember? See, here's the problem. We all want God to end sin and therefore the suffering it causes. We just don't want him to end ours. And we don't want him to end it his way. We certainly don't want him to do it now. That's a habit of Christ. Not least, because of all this humiliation, the enemy rejoices and is glad. Verse 15. He rejoices over us. He is the final hurtful humiliation in the list, being laughed at. Having the ungodly rejoice over our sorry but unrepentant condition. Having outraged. God has given no protection. The wicked foe rejoices. And verse 16 goes on and indulges in idolatry because of it. How odd is that? Idolatry and self-interest go hand in hand. Deifying what gives you what your flesh craves is very common. Therefore he sacrifices to his net. Burns incense to his dragon. But by his net he lives in luxury and enjoys the choicest food. People idolise what gives them what their flesh craves. Habakkuk is outraged by that. And he cries out to God. And he comes right back to how long, verse 17. Is he to go on emptying his net, destroying nations without mercy? Well, of course not, Habakkuk. You know the answer to that question. You've got your Old Testament. You know what's there. God is going to raise up a ruler of a reign in righteousness. And you're railing against God, but God is going to reign. He's, going to, he's, he's got some hands. He's, he's working his out. And times seem confusing and hard and difficult. God's got a plan. Habakkuk. You know God's got a plan. He is the Holy God. He is the one who's too righteous to look upon God. You know where this is going, Habakkuk. You were told. You were told way back before the monarchy was started, before all this, all this political system was erected. You were told. You know where this is going. And then here's the big challenge of this, and here's the big challenge of it to Habakkuk, and here's the big challenge of it to us as we go through lesser experiences of things that seem to not meet our expectations of God. But perhaps our expectations are not actually in line with the truth, with the way it is. Habakkuk, are you living in this moment? Or are you living with your eyes set on the future that God has prepared for his people and that he's moving this to? Because here's what the Bible tells us. Here's what Habakkuk knows the Bible tells him. Here's what Habakkuk knows about the character of God. God is not dead, but alive and active and working through human lives in the world in which things are not as we would like them to be. To get this world to a point where things are where we do want it to be. We understand that he plans for it to be. 
And are we living now with our eyes fixed here? Or are we living with our eyes fixed on God's future? And with where this is actually all getting us? See, that's, that's where faith happens. When things are turning out not as we expect and not as we aspire to, where do we go? Habakkuk goes back to the character of God. Now he's not unrealistic in this. He's not unrealistic in saying, oh well rejoice anyway and all that nonsense. He's saying, but Lord, I've got to hold this, what I see, together with that which I know. By faith in you. And where else am I going to go to? Because you have the words of eternal life and coming to you. There's nowhere else to go. Coming to you. And Lord, this looks wrong. And Lord, this is an outrage. And Lord, this is humiliating. And here's my big complaint. He's back to how long this? He knows that's the big thing. Because it's a matter of how long. Because it's not going to be like this forever. Can he hold that? Because he's living for the future of God's plan and purpose and what God is doing, even now. And which we will, we will be going to see. But don't see yet. Don't see because of our sinfulness, because of our need to be brought into his plans and purposes, and because our perspective on what is happening is so limited. Because faith says, Oh Lord, this hurts. But it goes on trusting. There's the challenge of this passage of scripture from Habakkuk. And next time, we're going to see how God responds to that. Which is quite surprising. And the time after that, we'll see an enormous change in Habakkuk. Which would never have taken place if we hadn't been through this passage.